How are the tests designed, IQ tests designed? How do they work? Maybe some examples for people who are not aware. What what makes a good IQ test question that sneaks up on this on this G factor measure? Well, your question is interesting because you want me to give examples of items that make good items. And what makes a good item is not so much its content, but its empirical relationship to the total score that turns out to be valid by other means. Yeah. So, for example, let, uh, let me give you an odd example from personality testing. Nice. So there's a, a personality test called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, MMPI. Been around for decades. I've heard about this test recently because of the Johnny Depp and uh, Amber Heard trial. I don't know if you've been paying attention to that. but they I, had I have not been paying attention they, to they it. They had psychologists on the, st on the stand, and they were talking. Apparently, those psychologists did... Uh, uh, Again, I'm learning so much from this trial. They they have uh, they did different uh, a battery of tests to uh, diagnose personality disorders. Apparently, there's that sy systematic way of doing so, and the Minnesota one is w one of the ones that there's the most science on. There's a lot of great papers which were all continuously cited on the stand, which is fascinating to watch. Well, Sorry, a little it, bit of a tangent. It's okay. I mean, this is interesting because you're right. It's been around for decades. There's a lot of scientific research on the psychometric properties mm -hmm. of the test, including what it predicts with respect to different categories of personality disorder. Mm -hmm. But what I want to mention is the content of the items on that test. All of the items are essentially true, false items. True or false, I prefer a shower to a bath. Mm -hmm. True or false, I think Lincoln was a better president than Washington. Mm -hmm. What of all these, what does that have to do? And the point is the content of these items, nobody knows why these items in aggregate predict anything, but empirically they do. It's a technique of, of choosing items for a test that is called dust bowl empiricism, <laughs> that the content doesn't matter, but there, for some reason, when you get a criterion group of people with this disorder and you compare them to people without that disorder, these are the items that distinguish irrespective of content. It's a hard concept to grasp. Well, uh, first of all, it's fascinating, but... Uh, from because uh, I, I I consider myself part psychologist because uh, I love human robot interaction and that's a problem. Half of that problem is a psychology problem because there's a human. Um, so designing these tests to get at the questions is is the fascinating part. Like, how do you get to uh, w w like what does dust bowl empiricism refer to? Does it refer to the final result. Yeah, so it's the test is Dust Bowl uh, uh, empiricism, but how do you arrive at the battery of questions? I presume uh, one of the things, now again, I'm going to the excellent testimony in that trial, uh, the explanation, because they also, they, ex they explain the tests, uh, <laughs> that a bunch of the questions are kind of make you forget that you're taking a test, like it makes it very difficult for you to somehow figure out what what uh, you're supposed to answer. Yes, it's called social desirability. But we're getting a little far afield because I only wanted to give that example of Dust Bowl empiricism. Yeah. When we talk about the items on an IQ test, many of those uh, items in the Dust Bowl empiricism uh, method have no face validity. In other words, they don't look like they measure anything. Yes. Whereas most intelligence tests, the items actually look like they're measuring some mental ability. So here's here's one of oh, the- So you were bringing that up as an example it, as what it is not. Yes. Got it. <laughs> okay. So I don't want to go too far afield on it. Uh, too far afield is actually one of the names of this podcast. So, uh, oh. <laughs> so I, should, I should mention that. Far uh, afield. Yeah. Far afield. Uh, yeah. So anyway, sorry. So so they feel the questions look like they, they pet- past the face validity test. And some more than others. So for example, let me give you a couple of things here. 
if I, one of the subtests on a, a standard IQ test is general information. Um, let me just think a little bit because I don't want to give you the actual item. But if I said, how far is it between uh, Washington, D.C. and Miami, Florida, within 500 miles, plus or minus? Well, you know, it's not a fact most people memorize, but you, you know something about geography. You, you say, well, I flew there once. I know planes fly for 500 miles. You know, yeah. you, can get, you can kind of make an estimate. But it's also seems like it would be very cultural, um, you know. Uh, so there's that kind of t uh, general information. Then there's vocabulary test. What does uh, regatta mean? And I choose that word because that word was removed from the IQ test because people complained that disadvantaged people would not know that word. Mm -hmm just from their everyday life. Okay, here's another example from a different kind of subtest. On, on What's regatta, by the way? A, a regatta is a- um, I think I'm like disadvantaged. A, a, a sailing competition, a competition with Boy. boats. Not I necessarily will... sailing, but a competition with boats. Uh, yep, yep. Okay. I'm proudly disadvantaged in that way. Okay, okay. excellent, so that was removed. Okay. Anyway, you were saying. Okay. So uh, here's, a, here's another subtest. I'm going to repeat a string of numbers, and when I'm done, I want you to repeat them back to me. Mm -hmm. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Seven, four, two, eight, one, six. That's way too many. Seven, four, two, eight, one, six. Okay. Well, you get the idea. Now, the actual test starts with a smaller number, you know, like two numbers, and then it is people get it right. You keep going adding to the string of numbers until they can't do it anymore. Yeah. Okay, but now try this. I'm gonna, re I'm gonna say some numbers, and when I'm done, I want you to repeat them to me backwards. I quit. <laughs> okay. Now, so I gave you some examples of the kind of items on an IQ test. Yes. General information. Um, I, I can't even remember all. G general information, vocabulary, digit span forward and digit span backward well you said i can't even remember them I, that's a good question for me uh what does memory have to do with okay, well, let's hold, let's, let's hold okay, on so, okay, let's, all right Sorry, let, let's man. let's let's just talk about these examples now some of those items mm -hmm. seem very cultural and others seem less cultural which ones do you think Scores on which subtest are most highly correlated with the G factor? Well, the, the intuitive answer is less cultural. Well, it turns out vocabulary is highly correlated, and it turns out that digit span backwards is highly correlated. Now, how do you how do you figure? Now you have decades of research. To answer the question, how do you figure? <laughs> right. So no, now there's like good research that gives you intuition about what kind of questions get at it. Just like uh, um, there's something I've done, I've actually used for research in semi-autonomous vehicle, like whether humans are paying attention, there's a body of literature that does like end back tests, for example, where you have to, um, put workload on the brain mm -hmm. to do recall, memory recall, and that helps you kind of put some work onto the brain while the person is doing some other task and this does some interesting research with that. Uh, but that's loading the memory. So there's like research around stably what that means about the human mind. And here you're saying recall backwards is a good predictor. The transformation. Yeah, so you have to so you have to do some some like you have to load that into your brain and not just remember it, but do something with it. Right. Now here's another example of a different kind of test called the Hick paradigm, and it's not verbal at all. It's a little box, and there are a series of lights arranged in a semicircle at the top of the box, and then there's a home button that you press. 
And when one of the lights goes on, there's a, a button next to each of those lights. You take your finger off the home button and you just press the button next to the light that goes on. And so it's a very simple reaction time. Light goes on, as quick as you can, you press the button and you get a reaction time from the moment you lift your finger off the button to when you press the, the button with where the light is. That reaction time doesn't really correlate with IQ very much. But if you change the instructions and you say, three lights are going to come on simultaneously, I want you to press the button next to the light that's furthest from the other two. Mm -hmm. So maybe lights one and two go on and, and light six goes on simultaneously. You take your finger off and you would press the button by light six. That's that reaction time to a more complex task. It's not really hard. Almost everybody gets it all right. But the, your reaction time to that is highly correlated with the G factor. This is fascinating. So reaction time. So there's a temporal aspect to this. So what what role speed does time? Speed of processing. It's the speed of processing. Is this also true for ones that take longer, like 5, 10, 30 seconds? Um, is time part of the measure with some yes. of these ideas? Yes. And that is why some of the best IQ tests have a time limit. Because if you have no time limit, People can do better, yeah. But it doesn't it doesn't distinguish among people that well. So that adding the time element is important. So speed of information processing, turn, and reaction time is a measure of speed of information processing. Turns out to be related to the G factor. 